County budget problems may mean the end to a massive project. We'll take a look at what happened. Plus, how will your money be spent in the state next year? And why the opening of a grocery store in Detroit is a big deal. My week starts right now. Michigan's turnaround is being powered by things we do better than anywhere else in the world. Today's global leaders routinely turn to Michigan to work on their most difficult problems. That's because the engineering talent in this part of the world is simply the best. So many possibilities lie ahead for Michigan's future. These opportunities are here and starting to happen. The vision for the new Michigan. Share it, talk it up, drive it home. A route map shows you where we go, but not how we get there. Because in this business, there are no straight lines. Only the twists and turns of an unpredictable industry. So the 80,000 employees at Delta must anticipate the unexpected and never let the rules overrule common sense. This is how we tame the unwieldiness of air travel until it's not just lines you see, it's the world. to my week. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Christy McDonald. A massive project for Wayne County has turned into a massive waste of money and time and could spell political disaster for County Executive Bob Ficano. Three years ago, the county approved plans to build a brand new jail downtown to consolidate three other jails. It was supposed to cost around $220 million, but it started running over budget. The scope of the project had to be pared down, but even with changes, it could cost a staggering $390 million. Now the county is putting the project on hold. A half-built jail on prime real estate that they've already sunk or reported $100 million into. How did this happen? That's where we start tonight. And joining me as always is Stephen Henderson, the editorial page editor from the Detroit Free Press, and Henry Payne, editorial writer from the Detroit News, who is filling in for Nolan Finley. It is great to have you, Henry. Thanks for joining us on my week. Much love you to have me. All right, so let's jump right on into this. This is a huge mess with this jail project, Stephen. Well, I mean, if you start, let's go back to the beginning. The idea that the place where everybody gets off the freeway coming into Detroit to go to the ballparks, to the to the football field, to this new entertainment sort of uh, center that we're building. They got a jail right we're there. We're going to put a big prison right there on the corner. I mean, that that's sort of where this mess started. It was a bad decision then. And then you sort of add the, 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 the craziness of Wayne County with contracting and planning, uh, management of a project that size. And, and, you know, it's just turned out to be a mess. And so it, it's a good thing that we have the opportunity, I think, to make a different decision and, and, and go a different direction. But it, it, this points to an awful lot of problems that we have around here. Well, then who made the decision initially to build it, to build it right there and then to go through this process? Well, I, I think we'll get into that. I mean, this is, this is an election season after all. And uh, Benny Napoleon is running for mayor. He's, he's uh, head of Wayne County Police. Um, he's the sheriff. You have uh, Ficano. Uh, trying to clear his name from uh, an FBI, uh, from a federal investigation, and, and this, of course, lands in his lap, in addition to all these scandals that have come before. So I think you'll, you'll be hearing a lot about this because, because there's politics involved as well. But, uh, but I, you know, to, to, uh, to Steve's point, uh, it, it's also interesting to hear the Gilbert people, uh, Matt Cullen and the Gilbert folks, talk about this because it is an opportunity to get things right downtown. Uh, the state's offering uh, new land out on Mound to, to locate this facility, and Gilbert's looking, this, looking at this as, as prime real estate to help that, that uh, downtown development. So like the casino, the initial casino's plans, plans, which didn't work out, maybe there's a silver lining in this and that you'll actually get a better dynamic downtown. How dangerous is it, though, that you can keep relying back to Dan Gilbert to call in for help to, to, bail, to, to bail us out? I mean, do you, do you go down a line where it's like, hey, you can't always rely on him to come out and save the day and say, well, I'll buy that piece of property. Right. Well, not just buy it, but, you know, this is this develop is it. playing Urban Planner, which he has been doing uh, for some time in Detroit. I mean, he's got Urban Planners on his payroll now who are looking at uh, downtown and, and the other areas around there and, and figuring out what is the best strategy for, for moving it forward. 
I think that speaks to how broken city government is. I mean, that that is the one of the prime city government functions, and uh, Gilbert feels like he can't rely on them uh, to do it. And this is a great example. They wanted to put a a, a jail uh, right at the, the the foot of the freeway when where everyone comes into the city. So uh, you know. It, Again, this whole thing just points to so many things around here that are not working the way they should, uh, and, and people have got to start paying attention and start making different decisions about who who's in charge. But but Christy, that's the, that. But that is the vacuum. I mean, this city is a, is a leadership vacuum right now, and and these and 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 from Gilbert to the state to to uh, Governor Snyder, the, the folks have stepped into the vacuum. This city is too important to the core of this metro area to be dysfunctional. And so Gilbert has taken over down, downtown, or has taken over the city government and the, and the finances. I mean, you even have folks like Jack White coming in and bailing out the Masonic Temple. Yeah, the Masonic Temple, Temple that came yeah, out this week, paying their back taxes. That's right. I mean, uh, you, you, you can't have a, a city like this exist in a vacuum. So these, these type A guys are coming in and, and getting things done. That's a good thing. All right, so let me say, if, if you're living in Wayne County, though, how angry are you? Cash strap county, already in, in trouble spent what a hundred million dollars already on something so you're not going to recoup that cost so yeah. now that's down the drain how does that affect what finances the county already has right now and come election time i think people are going to turn out and say well, i've had it yeah no well first of all you've seen some other counties around the country get into big trouble uh, just on projects like this uh, in in uh, Jefferson County, uh, <clears throat> Alabama, which is in uh, bankruptcy right now, one of the things that, that put them there was a giant project that was mismanaged uh, and, and where costs just spun out of control. So, so there is a real danger there. Uh, this is real money. Uh, the county doesn't have it. Uh, so, so the consequence could be something uh, pretty dire. The other consequence of this, the whole point of this new jail was to, to build it in, in a modern way that requires a lot less staffing than what we have now at the Wayne County Jail. Uh, you're going to have to retrofit this mound facility uh, much more extensively than anybody thinks right now. Then, well, then we're starting from scratch uh, and actually building a new facility that would have right. all the technology in it. That's right. I mean, I, I think I think that could be more expensive than than as you point out, uh, building from from scratch. So, you know, you spent a hundred million dollars. They borrowed two hundred million of a three hundred million dollar bond yeah. issue. Uh, you're going to end up spending every dime of that now and it's I think it's questionable whether that that makes a lot of sense given the city's or the the, the county's finances. Does it make a lot of sense Henry? Last word on this issue. Well I, I, I think to, to look at this uh, holistically I think it also points to a general trend in government to, of, of privatization. I mean the, the uh, projects like this show you how difficult it is for government to get business done. Uh, 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 Metro Airport, the McNamara Terminal was built by Northwest. Increasingly, Detroit is looking to privatize services. So again, as, as, as you look forward, I, I think this is an opportunity to make things more efficient by bringing the private sector in. All right, well, let's move on. Um, under the slightly boring but necessary heading, the budget is done. So what is your money being spent on? Let's take a look at where some of the $49 billion is going, and maybe most importantly, where it isn't going. $15 billion for schools. That includes K-12 higher ed as well as early childhood expansion. Also $350 million to fix roads and bridges. State revenue sharing for local services, police and fire, it's up by 4%. Also $75 million in the rainy day fund, but no expansion of Medicaid, no funding to implement Common Core state standards. So as the budget stands right now, are you saying, Stephen, that those are maybe the, the two most important things that legislature needs to go back and take a look at. Oh, I think there's no question they got to go back and, and fix those. The Common Core uh, standards in particular are, are problematic. Now you've you've uh, let teachers go into the summer, which is the, the serious planning period uh, for, for teachers in schools, without knowing what the curriculum is going to be in the fall. You're also now going to hold teachers accountable with these new uh, uh, performance evaluations according to, to who knows what standards. The MEEP, uh, which is our current test, won't mm -hmm. do that. Uh, this was a this was a major screw up by the legislature that that uh, the governor should have I think taken a much stronger role in leading them to, to fix um, uh, Medicaid expansion. Also leaving hundreds of millions of dollars in federal money on the table, costing the state more money. Uh, that's not a good thing. But I would add roads to that list. Uh, the, that was another big priority that Snyder laid out in February uh, that he wanted to get done in this budget, and we're still stalled on that. 
All right, Henry, do you agree it's a major screw-up that they kept uh, funding away from Common Core? Well, the, uh, I'm not much of an expert on the Common Core. I'll leave that to Steve. I, 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 I would point you to the fact that it's June and we have a budget. I mean, uh, the, the uh, <laughs> you know, the legislative, uh, Lansing works these days. Uh, well, it's uh, a budget without the stuff in it that we need in it. <laughs> the, the, we, we do have the stuff we need. I mean, the, 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 budget, the, the budget is balanced. We have money in the rating day, in the rating day fund. That's good news for the bond creditors. Uh, that's good news for the whole, the whole state that the state's running. You don't have this constant year-to-year -year crisis the way you had under the Granholm administration and the way you have in Washington, D.C. today. So there, there's, a, there's, there's finally a predictability and a logic to what's going on in, in uh, Lansing and, and to, the, to the Medicaid issue. Uh, look, the, the, this, this is a huge problem, not only in this state, but nationally. The, 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 the Affordable Care Act is extremely unpopular in this country. It's unpopular in state legislatures, particularly Republican legislatures, uh, because the potential, the, the potential of cost to states is enormous. But even if it's unpopular, it is now the law of the land. Right. Isn't there something to the effect of that you have to start carrying through and putting in, I implementing things that have, have now come through with this? Well, it's, it's the law of the land, but it's bad law. I mean, it's, you have California. We, we just got a report from California showing that California, uh, which has been implementing a, a similar version of, of Obamacare on a state level, has seen premium increases of 170, 200 percent. I mean, this is not affordable. This is not an affordable care act. And that's not just uh, for, for customers of the act. It's also for states. I, 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 I sympathize with Snyder, who's been trying to get this, this in place because there is a lot of federal money that comes with this, yeah. which is mm -hmm. important to the state. On the other hand, what happens when the, when the federal government goes bankrupt? I mean, the, the Medi Medicaid has gradually been bankrupting this state. It is now 25% of the state's budget. All right, Stephen, last word on this. Well, I mean, I think uh, Affordable Care Act is the law. Uh, any, but let, let's take that out of the picture. Any health care reform has to depend on getting more people insured. The problem with these people, 400,000 people who have no insurance right now, is that we do pay for that. We pay for that when they show up in the emergency room. We pay th th for that through our higher premiums. Yeah, but uh, the answer is not Medicaid. It's the Medicaid, Medicaid is the worst. Medicaid is actually more, more effective and efficient it is than, not. Than, no, than no insurance. It is it not. We, do, is. we just had a major study coming out of Oregon that shows that Medicaid patients are no, no better off, in many cases worse off, than patients who are not on Medicaid. Let it's me ask, a disastrous program. Let me ask this, to wrap this up. So is there any chance that legislators are gonna, they're gonna do any kind of work this summer on that, on Common Core? I think, I think the governor will, will try to, behind the scenes, get some work done and, and then make a big push in the fall before, you know, you, you've still got a month uh, in September when, they're, when they'll be back when you can try to get all this stuff done. I think they, I think he'll be really focused on this and it's a, it's a slap in his face. These were his three big priorities coming uh, into this session and he and didn't none have in any the budget. All right, well, let's move on. Less than 10 cents on the dollar. That's reportedly what Detroit Emergency Manager Kevin Orr will offer creditors next week in what's expected to be a pivotal meeting to avoid bankruptcy. It's a huge front page story for the free press today. Um, that's a staggering amount for it. So small, less yeah. than 10 cents on the dollar. Well, it's a wake-up call to the creditors that there's no money. You know, uh, th we are we are out of cash. Uh, but they have to know that in terms of watching reports and seeing what's been happening. I think it's one thing to watch it. It's another thing to be sort of shown as they're going to be next Friday exactly how bad it is, how, exactly how little money there is. Uh, and, you know, okay, so the creditors are first in line here to hear how bad it is the next uh, the next thing will be the unions, uh, who will be told, here's what we can do uh, to satisfy the, the terms of our, of our contracts with you, and we probably can't do any more. Um, I mean, I think everybody's got to sort of come to the realization that we're, we're, at, we're at the end here. We're at the, the, the bottom where uh, there are no options and there's no other way out but to, but to give everybody an extreme haircut. It feels like we've been at the bottom so long or saying this is the bottom or no, no, we finally reached the bottom. Henry, how does this play out in a meeting like this next week? Well, just, 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 just look back a couple of years to the GM and Chrysler bankruptcies and the, and the, uh, the creditors were screaming about 29 cents on a dollar that was, that was forced on them, that was crammed down on them from Washington. 10 cents on a dollar is, 
is really is really a bad return. Steve's mm -hmm. right. They know they they know this is coming. They know that the city finances are in bad shape. But creditors represent real people. They represent pensioners. They represent people who depend on income. So, guess what? They're going to be looking at, at city assets. Uh, this dovetails with a story about the DIA assets being on the table. So if you're if you're asking creditors for ten cents on a dollar, they're going to ask that everything else be on the table too. So these are going to be some tough negotiations. What else do you think is going to be put on the table if, if Henry's saying DIA? Oh, I think everything has to be. Uh, you know, one of the things you have to do is you got to rationalize your assets. Uh, that's that's a pretty common practice before you get into bankruptcy, so, uh, which means you either have to explain why it can't help your bottom line or make it help your bottom line more. That's what the, the DIA negotiations are about. It's an asset that right now contributes nothing uh, to city coffers. Is there a way that, that you can make it uh, contribute something? Uh, that's an important argument to make to creditors who are being told, you know, there's no more money. Uh, it's also an ar important argument to make to the unions uh, th who will be told, you know, we can't afford to fulfill the, the terms of our agreements with you. I think it's really interesting too because as more and more of the details come out about this and the financial shape of the city of Detroit and then talking about the DIA and assets, Henry, what you were talking about, I, I think it's educating people who are watching this unfold ab about a bankruptcy process or, or what this actually might look like, but we still don't even, sh we're not even quite sure what all the details, how this actually will all end up and that's I think can be concerning for people as well in the region. Well, I, I, I think actually uh, people in this region are are pretty comfortable with bankruptcy. Uh, um, I mean, after the last couple of years. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, uh, bankruptcy works very well in the United States uh, in, in in the private economy and the private private sector. It's but very, we don't know how it would work though for the city of exactly, Detroit. Exactly, exactly. And so now, but what's new about this is is Chapter Nine coming to cities. I mean, we're we're just seeing the difficulties that a couple of California cities are having in dealing with Chapter Nine. Uh, uh, for Chapter 11, for private companies, I mean, this is a useful tool, and so, so I, I think we're, we're as, as usual, uh, Detroit's a bit on the cutting edge of these financial issues, but it'll be interesting to see how municipalities can use this to, to their benefit. All right, so Stephen, give hopefully, me hopefully they can. Hopefully, give me kind of then a time frame. What are we looking at? What what's going to play out over the next? couple of weeks. Well, uh, next Friday is when they will sit down with everybody, the creditors, the unions, all the stakeholders and say, here is our plan to, to, to get ourselves out of this financial mess. Uh, after that, uh, you know, everybody's either got to take it or, or leave it. And if they if And they what's leave the time it, frame for that? I mean, do you, is there an exact time frame? I think they I think they have the, a very short window. There's an important payment that's due uh, from the city on the 15th. I don't think they plan to make that payment. And so now you're talking about creditors just not getting any money. Uh, so there will be a very hurried effort to, to sort this out and decide, are we going to take this or are we going to go to bankruptcy and uh, see what the courts will give us. All right, well, let's move on to just a little bit of good news in the city of Detroit. It's probably the most celebrated grocery store opening in years. Whole Foods Market opened their Midtown location on Wednesday. So why is a new store in Detroit such a big deal? People crowded into Whole Foods and cheered like it was a celebration, and in a way it was. It's another big name investing in the city's Midtown area that could encourage other investors to follow. It's interesting to do a story like this coming off of the discussion we just had. So you have someone like Whole Foods Market coming in, and it was a big deal when it was announced, the planning of it and opening of it, under the shadow of what's happening now and what Kevin Orr has to do. Does this encourage though other investors to come in when they see a Whole Foods investing in Detroit? Well, I think what we've seen in other cities is that it does. Uh, I wrote a, a column this week about Baltimore, uh, where I used to live, uh, where a Whole Foods, Whole Foods created an entire neighborhood uh, on the east side of downtown that did not exist before. There was really nothing uh, over there, and they were the first, uh, the first sort of place to pop up. Same thing in uh, uh, Logan, Logan Circle in, uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, another sort of area that was really struggling until Whole Foods went there. Whole Foods has a track record of investing in places that, that have great potential, and they have a, an even better track record of bringing other retailers along with them. So I think the hope is uh, that we will see other people say, well, if Whole Foods is there, we probably can make some money there too. Let's let's see what's available. So, Henry, the opening of a grocery store is a big deal in Detroit. It, it, it is. I mean, I, I live in Oakland County, and and uh, grocery stores are on every corner, and it, it is remarkable 
to, to, to see this kind of enthusiasm, but I, and, and what it does is, is it shows you how far the, the per capita income in Detroit has fallen. The, 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 the key point about that 700,000 population figure that we keep talking about, the 25% drop in Detroit population in the last decade, is that that was the black middle class leaving this city. There is no middle class left in Detroit. The, 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 and, and that is why you don't have uh, whole food supermarkets, it's why you don't have movie theaters, it's why folks in Detroit, uh, yeah, they, they got the Rensen is the only movie theater in 138 square miles. And that's because there's no middle class. And when what, what Gilbert, again, what, what Gilbert and, and Orr and all these people are concentrated on is trying to bring a middle class back to Detroit. It starts with the downtown square mile. That's what Whole Foods is about. That's what uh, some of these other openings, uh, uh, Trader Joe's will be coming in down there as well. That's what all this is about, is trying to get a middle class back. That's, that's, your, that's not only your spending base, that's your tax base. So will we know that we've succeeded, uh, that we're starting to, to come out of this, or we're coming back when we don't have to celebrate the opening of a grocery well, store? Well, yeah, I mean, we should, I think the celebration was a little over the top this week. I mean, people were turning cartwheels down Woodward about a grocery store in, in what used to be the industrial capital of the world. There's a lot of irony uh, in that image. Uh, I, I think that, I think pretty quickly, though, uh, you know, as much as the, the city's finances, the city government's finances are a mess and we're, we're still sorting that out, the, the private sector side of things in downtown and midtown really is looking up and I think it's going to be pretty fast that, that, that something like Whole Foods opening won't be such a, a big deal. I, th I think we're going to see some other people come in pretty fast. But you, yeah. you also need a Whole Foods coming in without subsidies. I mean, without these, subsidies. Right. Yeah, these things are happening yeah. with massive subsidies yeah. just to get these businesses in here. All right. And now to today's celebration of the longest serving congressman in history, the Dean of the House and Michigan Representative John Dingell. He is making the TV rounds and here's a look at him getting some laughs on the Colbert Report on Comedy Central. Take a look. You've been in Congress. Can you hear? Longer than Hawaii's had a congressman. <laughs> And longer than Alaska. Longer than Alaska, too. Did you vote in Congress to include Hawaii? Yes. And so Alaska. we can blame Obama on you. Uh. <laughs> I'm sorry, you caught me there because at the end he was, he was supposed to say, I think you can blame Obama's mother and father. I think they had something to do with it. Um, it's great to see John Dingell in that kind of light. And, and um, 1955. Is, yeah, uh, no, when he came that's in, it's, uh, a long time. It's an amazing, uh, yeah. amazing thing. And um, gentleman, uh, yeah. lawmaker. I mean, really, uh, really just an incredible uh, person in, ad in addition to an amazing legislator. I mean, I, th I think it's very hard to find other legislators who have had as much to do with as much significant legislation over, you know, decades uh, as, as he has. I mean, even if he had left let's say he'd left that seat 30 years ago, he'd still be one of the most accomplished uh, legislators. But, but he's also just a, a spectacular human being. I mean, somebody who, whose gentility and respect for other people has a lot to do with his success in Washington. He can deal with uh, people he disagrees with strenuously and not be disagreeable about it. And it's something that you and I were talking about earlier, that, that he has that ability. Yeah, he is, uh, I, I disagree with John Dingell on most things. Um, but but I, I think what's interesting uh, about Dingle is, is that he's a man that you can that, that you can sit down at a table with and, and, and work things through. He's amiable, he's got a good sense of humor. And I think that's a change in the Democratic Party as well. I mean, you, you look back, you don't have to look back over 57 years, just look over the last 20 years. And, and, the, and the party has shifted to the coasts. Mm -hmm. The Democratic Party, you hasn't to, shifted as much as the Republican Party has shifted to the South, but but well, there's, but but but, 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 but a, there's been a little bit of a shift. Last word, ten seconds, Henry. But but when when you had guys like Dingle and, and Dick Gephardt running the Democrat the Democratic Party from Middle America, from 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 a labor perspective, from a manufacturing yeah. perspective, you had a less ideological party. It, and a more and, and a more uh, uh, and a party more open to compromise. All right, and congratulations to John Dingle. That'll do it for this week. Thanks to Henry Payne for joining us, and Stephen, take care. We'll see you next week.